and welcome to Oh What a Lovely Podcast, where popular culture meets the First World War. In this episode, Jessica, Chris and I are going to be discussing John Buchan's The 39 Steps, which we seem to have referenced on numerous occasions in the last 29 episodes. First appearing as a serial in Blackwood magazine in the summer of 1915, it was published in book form in October of the same year. The book follows the adventures of Richard Hannay, an all-action hero with a stiff upper lip and a knack for getting himself out of tricky situations. Set in May 1914, we follow Hannay as he goes on the run for a murder that he didn't commit, while at the same time he tries to solve the mystery of who is trying to steal the British and French naval dispositions. There's been four film adaptations of The 39 Steps, the first and probably best known being the 1935 version by Alfred Hitchcock. Subsequent versions uh, are followed in 1959, 1978, and are made for TV movie from the BBC in 2008. There are numerous uh, radio adaptations I discovered when I was diligently going to listen to a lot of them, and I thought perhaps not, including one by Orson Welles, and the Mercury Theatre, which is rubbish, and it has been adapted for Theatre 2, which is good. <laughs> um, um, now, that was a bit, bit, of a, bit of a whirlwind. Where, where, do we, where do we want to start? You know, obviously, as, as long-term listeners of our podcast for now, anyone who's interacted with me in what kind of wider academia, you know, I have a, you know, a very well-earned reputation for being deeply, deeply insightful and very, very kind of good at spotting things. And I, I noticed something in this book, and this might shock you, but bear with me. I detected, it's quite subtle, an element of anti-Semitism in this, in this book. Um, my first clue is on page six, where the mysterious character goes, well, the Jew's behind everything and the Jew hates Russia. But, you know, you've got to really read between the lines to, to draw it out. I, I think, Chris, you'll find when you get to the next two books, it's not quite as subtle in the uh, subsequent <laughs> books. Well, I'm, I'm really glad, therefore, that I've got, I've got kind of that, my mind honed in on it, so I'll be able to spot the... the the, the clues. Sh- shall we make the point that it's not just anti-Semitism? I mean, the anti-Semitism, I think we're, we're, we are hyper aware of, but this this is a book that um, would need all sorts of content warnings if it ever <laughs> goes, you know, if I ever decide to put it on a reading list at all. Um, the language is very euphemistically of its time. You know, those, those lists uh, where they ask the great and the good for, you know, their favorite film and their, you know, um, there's one that, that always does the guiltiest cultural pleasure. And mine is always these novels. I can give you chapter and verse about everything that is politically incorrect about them. They are cracking great yarns. They are such good reads is the problem. <laughs> and I say this is someone who's read quite a lot of this, this brand of, of thriller, particularly, particularly some of the later ones, uh, the post, uh, as we get into the war years and the post-war years, that can really fits in with, with the um, formula that, Sapper then picks up for for his novels and eventually becomes Ian Fleming's James Bond. Um, but but there is this formula of the interwar thriller that Bakken falls into, having developed from the pre-war German scare story, which of course is what is what the Thirty Nine Steps is. Part of that formula is this, you know, <laughs> British imperial supremacy um, underpinning everything and um, and deeply anti-communist, deeply uh, classist, um, to use a term that that always sounds very clunky to me, but you know this, this is about the, 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 the good British yeoman stock who conquered the, the world um, and, and the, their right to dominate. and that, that's the underpinning politics. Buckingham was a conservative politician. And by the time you get to the three hostages, which actually does deal with post-war politics to some extent, oh my word, it is it, it is not even as subtle as, as, as the anti-Semitism that you have picked up on, Chris. <laughs> and yes, in the contemporary day and age, this is a problem. They are still very, very, very fun stories to read, I'm afraid. It's very readable. <laughs> they are really readable. I, and and Buckingham of all of them, it, you know, of all of this type of formulaic thriller writer is, is by some way the best stylist um, that I'm aware of. Were these designed to be serialised? Were they serialised before they came out or did it come out in, in novel form? Because it has that kind of serialised narrative of, you know, constant cliffhangers. Each chapter is a separate scene. I think as, as Angus mentioned, The 39 Steps is 
much the way the Riddle of the Sands is, isn't it? Burskin Childers was was originally published as as a serial. I don't know about the later ones. Green Mantle is flat out propaganda. <laughs> you, know, at the, you you can tell the point where Buchan starts working for Wellington House with these novels. So at this point, mid mid war, what, 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 Buchan becomes a propagandist for the British Army, doesn't he? And that's presumably when he's writing Green Mantle, which is a rip roaring chase through Central Europe to the Ottoman Empire. Yeah, and and it's quite an interesting one. I I seem to recall, but because of, because of its location and the fact that it's dealing with the the threat of Germany changing the, the the direction of the war through motivating the Muslim population of the Ottoman Empire and then using that to re, to inflame the Muslim population of India is the plot and thereby undermining Britain's imperial holdings. I seemed I, this may be apocryphal, but sometime after nine eleven, apparently it became quite popular in the U.S. Something is a slightly confusing you know, origins of what's going on in the Middle East and why, why, we're, why there are people who want to bomb us <laughs> um, from, from, from Afghanistan and, and, um, and that part of the world, which, of course, prior to 9-11, I don't think the U.S. really thought about at all, which, which you know, helpfully leaves out the entire Sykes-Pico agreement and, and, and all the politics of it. But, but as I said, that might be an apocryphal story, but I do seem to recall hearing that somewhere. So, yeah, it, it is... It is dealing with the pol- politics of Islam as a religion um, and, and the perception of, of that as a threat to Europe. Hani himself is a, is a colonial, isn't he? Uh, you know, there, there is this, I, I always had this sense of him being a, a stranger in a strange land, almost wherever he, he is, it, it, certainly in the 39 steps. And then and he goes, oddly enough, he goes to Scotland where he feel, feels at home because, because he's a colonial and he's out of this urban environment. I wonder, does does, does Hannah need to be? What? Why? Why has Buchan chosen him to be a African and a South African, white South African? Well, he needs to give him some more experience, doesn't he? Yeah, to make him so that he's you know he's handy and he, he knows the skills. It's the Matabili War is his war. It's not South Africa. It's not the South African War. It's the Matabili War. I wonder if there's an idea, and it got me a lot thinking about the Boy Scouts and Baden Powell and this connection with South Africa. And the, the fact that I wonder it to be an individual, you have to be you know, the colonial, uh, the white colonial is, is, is sort of a rugged individualist, which perhaps the urbane English uh, type isn't. And then that got me thinking of ideas of sort of Fitzlang's um, metropolis. And so you're, he has to leave London to go out and, and you can get this constant reference to the the Velt and his, his best mate, Peter Pina, who, who, who is certainly prominent in the next two books, being the ultimate super soldier is Peter because of this rugged individual individualism, which is sort of Baden Powell's sort of pushing with the, with the, um, with the Boy Scouts, learn bushcraft skills, uh, stand up on your own two feet. There's also, <clears throat> with him kind of being an, an outsider in England and, and, you know, basically wanting to get out of London and go and do the things. You can see the the, the lineage that then leads to, as an aside, uh, Bulldog Drummond, who just finds everything boring. That aspect, but you know, with with Hanny finding London unfulfilling. But I think there's also there's a there's a wider narrative purpose because you need him to have you know elements of the right connections, which he draws on at various points in the Thirty Nine Steps, but also not connected enough that the logical thing for him to do upon this murder happening wouldn't be to go to his mates. It's to, you know, escape into the wilderness. You know, his own kind of, he's got his kind of private club and the like that, that comes up at various points. But um, you do kind of end up at times thinking that there are only six people living in England at this time and they're all cracking good chaps and they're all related to each other. And it turns out they're all in government or they're German spies. But, but, but it is, you know, that, that, that image of London. And yes, it does lead to the, you know, the, the ex-officer who finds peace dull, that ad that, that Hugh Drummond puts in the, in the, uh, paper at the start of Bulldog Drummond, but actually, because of the publication date of 1915, it's much more about the uh, narrative of decadence that was the one of the themes of this German spy novel. This idea that th- there had been fears of a European war, right, leading up to this, and every time there was a Balkan crisis, um, someone came up with this idea. This this idea that the metropole, that Europe was decadent you know and i think that that's that's a key part 
of this imperial propaganda. It, it's not just war scare propaganda that the Buckland's putting, putting out. It is imperial propaganda. Europe is decadent. It needs a Holocaust. It needs a cleansing fire that it's got to come. If, if, if the center is that decadent, then the, the instrument, you know, part of the instrument of this has to come or, or to prevent it, you know, to simply collapsing in on itself has to come from the empire. The empire is going to save the center, which is another reason I think that, that Henny has to be a, a colonial. Britain has rotted on the inside and it needs the extremities um, that remain kind of pure to come in and, and sort stuff out. And interestingly, Germany as well, which you don't really get until till Mr. Standfast, where on at least three occasions in Mr. Standfast, Hanny accuses uh, the Graf von Schwabing, who is one of the three men. Sorry, spoiler alerts here. <laughs> um, but one of the three men who, who are the spies in the 39 Steps escapes from prison and reappears in Mr. Standfast as the Graf von Schwabing, who's accused not once but twice of not being a gentleman, as the British understand it. <laughs> which is extraordinary. There is no more serious charge. It's very much an understanding of, of German, the German aristocracy as corrupt. And what's, what's quite interesting is that having been an outsider and traveling across Europe and speaking German and speaking Dutch um, through a lot of green mantle, at the start of The Three Hostages, the post-war novel, where Buckingham tries to get to grips with Ireland in really, really interesting and complicated ways. Um, Hanny's married and settled down in the Cotswolds and is becoming a farmer and is, you know, is, is defined as, as English as you can get in much the same way Sir Walter Bullivant is at, in the 39 Steps. What, one of the things that Buckingham's really, uh, really good at is writing landscape, all sorts of landscape. It's really, it's really interesting. By, by the end of the war, he wants Hanny to personify Britain rather than the empire. And that's quite an interesting shift. Is he becoming that, um, uh, isn't this what worth fighting for poster, which is an amalgamation of um, half a dozen parts of the country that don't actually exist with a soldier and a kill? Yeah. <laughs> well, I wonder, is that why the escape to Scotland, does that bring in a, 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 an idea of Britain, Britishness, which somehow it doesn't include Ireland but, uh, or, or Wales, but the, rem, going out of England to a, an, another part of Britain? It'd be a bit much to have him touring around Ireland and, and Wales to be completely uh, inclusive. But I did wonder if that gave a sense of Britishness to remove him to Scotland. It's completely bizarre that he gets in a train for... I mean, there's whole, whole chunks of this that somehow don't necessarily hang together. I've never been to the country before. I know, I'll jump on a train and escape to Scotland. <laughs> to spin the wheel of possible destinations. Lowland, Scotland, you know, I'll go around, uh, you know... Just over the border before you know detouring back to Britain to solve solve the because it's almost like an adjunct is the is the trip to Scotland. I mean, I, I suspect it reflects Buchan's knowledge of the country because because he keeps ending up in Scotland. He ends up in Scotland in Mister St- the beginning of Mister Stanfast again, um, and then the end of the Three Hostages takes place on a shooting estate in the Highlands. It's called Macrae. Am I right? That's some that's an element that the film picks up. The first film. Did they name the place in Scotland that they go in the Hitchcock film? Isn't there a map scene? Now you've completely. I've only. I, I, I last watched the uh, theatre version, uh, and it, it, it's sort of tarnished because there's a lot. In fact, there's a large map scene in that as well, and there's a joke about being able to say one of the Scottish names and not spitting everywhere. So my assumption is it must be named in the film uh, because it, 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 it's a very close adaptation, just played for laughs. The, the play is, is is a spoof of the film rather than a spoof of the books because it is worth it is worth pointing out that, that the film is its own creation it is only very loosely based on on the plot for a very good reason which of course is the only women in the 39 steps are crofters wives if i'm correct is that right to call them bit parts would be uh possibly over exaggerating them whereas hitchcock brings them front and center and gives us a love interest and in fact, Hitchcock twists it from a from a thriller, so by thirty five when this is made, into almost a, a, a screwball comedy. But it doesn't quite always get to what you would call. There's scenes of screwball comedy where Hannah is on the run uh, and he's he's picked up Pamela and he's he's handcuffed to Pamela, who's on the run with him. And there's sort of that that scene in the in the uh, hotel where she's taking off her. 
uh, stockings, which seems rather risky for 1935. And she she gives Hannah a, a sandwich to distract his attention from looking at her legs as as she, as she takes off the helmet, uh, takes off her stockings, and that that almost knocks us into uh, the screwball comedy genre of sort of bringing up baby. But we don't quite get there. No, it's bring up baby's 1938. So perhaps this is a, a bit. I don't know when the screwball comedy. Genre is at its zenith, <laughs> like a proto screwball comedy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 but the, the, the theatre player just takes that Hitchcock film and just says, "Look, let, let's just play it all for laughs." And, and I would suggest that the the uh, dialogue isn't very far from the film. It's just the way it's uh, portrayed and performed just makes it really funny. I mean, it's supremely funny. But that that that's what the play then picks up. Um, yeah. And satirizes. I mean, that's uh, you know different time period, different genre. But that's um, the film Airplane with Leslie Nielsen and the like is based on an actual drama film called something like Terror at Fifty Thousand Feet or something like that. And most of the dialogue in it is verbatim from the drama film, but they just play it for laughs. Um, in that kind of well, this we've watched this this thing, and clearly you know there was elements of like drama in it and maybe a hint of comedy. But what if we just aim directly at the comedy? Um, and just ch- change the inflection. And it's interesting, you get the 78 uh, film is not played for laughs at all. It is serious. It's, you know, I guess this is the Cold War world and, you know, we're all under threat and it's the same sort of the, we're under threat, Britain under threat sort of uh, feel to, the, to, that, to that film with Hanny on the run and there's people getting shot and action scenes with fighting. and Which is the one with Rob, Robert Powell in That's it? That's the 78 one. That's 78 one. Because they, they also changed in that one what the 39 steps were. Well, the 39 steps, it, it's funny because the 39 steps, oddly, it's a, it's a f- peculiar title for a book that is, li- the 39 steps is not necessarily central. H- Hitchcock brings the idea of the 39 steps central when he says that's the name of the secret organisation. But in the book, it is literally, it's just 39 steps. It's a, it's a stair. <laughs> it's a 39 steps to the beach. <laughs> down to the beach <laughs> and it, it's it, you know it's that that serial nature of it, it it becomes central to only one part of of the cryptic clue and and then of one section and it's really interesting if you read across the books bucken does this thing of he has different locations where action takes place across all different books so you can see clear splits between scotland and the south you know in the 39 steps, you get the Cotswolds, the north sort of generally, but mainly in Scotland, and then Switzerland and eventually France in Mr. Stanfast. And then you get Europe and the east, you know, Constantinople and, and, and the, the east, the Middle East in Green Mantle. And you get these very distinctive locations that sort of chop up the narrative. And Mr. Stanfast in particular feels like a complete mess. I forgot how much it sort of roamed all over the place. And the 39 Steps is only one part of one of those sections, which is, yeah, you're right. It is an odd. What would you call it? It's a good mystery title for the book. It's slightly odd for the film because it almost takes away the mystery by saying, oh, it's just the organisation. Uh, yeah, that, as you say, that cryptic clue is sort of work, works with the book, book title because you could go all the way through. Go, what the bloody hell? Thirty nine steps. How does this fit in? What thirty nine steps to where or what? Whereas just to but then they, they, they don't really quantify why the organisation's called the thirty nine steps. Oh, they just call the thirty nine steps, which isn't particularly. It's not like no, it's not like the black hand or you know some sort of. It's in in the book. It it the black stone, which does get then put into the German. And I, I suspect the Blackstone's chosen because Die Schwarze Stein sounds quite good. <laughs> if we're going to touch on Blackstone and the Black Hand, the obviously the, there's this long kind of ongoing um, plot line within um, 39 Steps about, is it the president of Greece, who's like the smartest man in Europe and he's going to solve all of the problems and there's this assassination threat over him and then he's going to, you know, the idea is that he's coming to England and like it, but then he does get, he does get off. Does that mean that Archduke Franz Ferdinand was the smartest man in Europe who was going to solve all of the problems and unfortunately he gets gunned down? Is that, is that what's happening? Is that Because I mean, I'm, I'm thinking back to our, our episode on Archduke Franz Ferdinand and I think even charitably we wouldn't have come to that conclusion. I, I, I don't think so. 
um, because I, th- I think this is where where the book is going into the sort of speculative German scare literature of. And have either of you read The Riddle of the Sands or When the Germans Came, which is dreadful. Oh, my God, it's the most appallingly written book. But it's, it's quite interesting as a, as a bit of historical literature. But The Riddle of the Sands has this very, very, very complicated plot that essentially revolves around the Navy and dreadnought and the building of dreadnoughts, which, again, we get the Navy here. So I think there's, there's an element at which Buchan's just sort of making up the politics to fit in with a more generic concern about the British Navy um, rather than trying than there being an accurate reflection of, of how war broke out. And Hitchcock changes that threat to uh, air defence or, or, or air technology, doesn't he, which is the threat at the time with the, with the idea of the bomber always gets through. And I think, they, I think the 59 film is about rocket technology. Might be wrong there. I think 78 goes back to being the Navy again, a threat about the Navy, which tries to give it some sort of historical grounding. And I can't remember the 2008 film. <laughs> There's some interesting modernity stuff going on in it with planes and cars and, and the like. I, mean, I, I think I've mentioned it before, the, the, the novel about um, the American space program called The Right Stuff, where all of those test pilots are always driving fast cars because they think, you know, I'm a fantastic pilot and therefore I'm a fantastic car driver and I'm an adventurer and all of that. There's an element of that in Hanny. You know, he gets in a car and he sets off at a million miles an hour when he, di- he ditches quite a few of them into <laughs> rivers and stuff. But... but he does in all three books, Hanny crashes. I mean, he is not the man to let drive. <laughs> he is not the man to let drive at all. But you have that thing, don't you, where he's been sort of chased by a plane, which then Hitchcock uses again in North by Northwest, uh, which I, which was pointed out somewhere when I was buffing up. It, it's almost like a, a rerun of of uh, 39 Steps, you know, a man wrongly accused. And, and then amusingly, I don't know if you spotted in the, in the, in the play, Jessica, you sent us the link to, there's, a, there's the plane coming in and they shout, which direction is it? And he shouts out, it's coming from north by northwest. <laughs> uh, which I thought was a good, a good nod to, to, the, to the north by northwest. I mean, the, the, the play is a love letter to Hitchcock as much as it is to, to John Buchan. I mean, even more so, I'd say. There is a lot about modernity here, and because then when you get to Green Mantle, there's a lot of talk about, you know, sort of primitive religious fanaticism, and and the final scene of Green Mantle involves them sweeping into uh, Erzurum on horseback with Cossacks and Sandy Arbuthnot as Green Mantle in in this symbolic religious robe riding into into the city and and. The, the fleeing Turks as Muslims seeing him as the great prophet and bowing down on either side. It's, it's, it's a... That's a whole thing. Probably needs more unpacking than we have time for here as an image. <laughs> but yeah, the, the, there's a lot of tension between the old and the new, um, which of course is, is one of the keys to modernist aesthetic um, as it develops. I had a train of thought. I'm just trying to. Th- I, I made a note of it. I can't. I can't think of it. So I asked you just before we started what the occupation was of uh, Professor Jordan. So Professor Jordan is Hitchcock's uh, leader of the Thirty Nine Steps organization. Because it occurred to me when you get to the seventy eight film, the bad guy, Sir Edmund Appleton, is an industrialist. I think, isn't he? And 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 you get sort of Hanny exclaim with his. It's not Hanny. I think it's Walter Bullivant. It talks about uh, you know, problems with Jews and high finance. I wondered if that had anything. You know, what, what does that say about? Did, did, is there anything to be said about uh, almost economics and how how finance and money and industrialists are are, 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 are polluting the world? There, there's a lot of stuff about strikes. One of the anxieties, of course, that comes out, Mr. Stanfast, is is the threat of strikes in munitions factories and and the the fifth column work, the the stuff that. Hanny's initially tracking that, you know, the, 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 we'll have to talk about conscientious objectors in their portrayal in a minute, but, but, but the communities in which he's moving as a undercover in the beginning of, of Mr. Stanfast, one of the things that they're suspected of is fomenting strike action. There, there, is, there is an anxiety about, you know, the, the, the significance of industry, both as a driver for the war, but, but as a weakness in the event that the workers stop working. That, that's, that's almost an economic pressure from below rather than an economic corruption from above. It is that idea of the, the Jew, uh, Chris's original 
point. Do you have that quotation, Chris, about, you know, the, I'll see if I can find it in my copy. Oh, I've got it. I've, yeah, let, let me, let me. So uh, when I asked why, he said that the anarchist lot thought it would give them their chance. Everything would be in the melting pot and they looked to see a new world emerge. The capitalists would rake in the shakers and make fortunes by buying up wreckage. Capital, he said, had no conscience and no fatherland. Besides, the Jew was behind it and the Jew hated Russia worse than hell. And um, then it goes on to say, have you never noticed basically that, you know, Jews are in charge of all industry and something equally. In- but it's, it's, that, it's that point about the capital having no conscience that reappears in the three hostages where the gang that takes the three hostages. And this, this is a I'd have to check the dates, whether it's a straight lift from from um, Sapper or the other way around, which one of them. I mean, they, they both have this idea that that capitalism without conscious then after the war sets about wrecking the economy and acts as you know symbolic wreckers and this is this is the gang that Hanny is going after in the three hostages which is the fourth novel set after the war and then it gets complicated because the mastermind behind the gang is this this anglo-irish messianic figure um with a spanish name so he gets to be a dago as well as irish Taking things off of the the, the the bingo card. I think that we we might we might have to have a content warning of, for the language before this episode. I'm, I'm quite surprised that someone um, hasn't been through and uh, published a uh, 20th century uh, version and t- taking out and smoothed off some of the. Uh... I, I'm not sure you could, because in taking all of that out, if you, you know, if you made it a politically correct novel in all ways including adding women if we make it politically politically correct we just end up with the films <laughs> i'm not sure you could call the hitchcock politically correct <laughs> you might end up with the play now do we know how popular this was at the time so you know, clearly by 1939 hitchcock picks it up and i have no doubt that it, 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 he will have shifted a lot of books after the film uh, was released but do we know how, how popular it was when it was released in 1935? I was trying to find circulation figures for Blackwell magazine. Uh, it's, it's very popular. Uh, uh, is, is it literally in, in soldiers' kit bags? Is there a... I don't, no, I don't think so. Um, not the way some things are. But, but soldiers' reading is really weird because they pick things up and they drop them and they don't want to carry books. But um, Edmund King has done some work on the circulating library that E.W. Hornung, who wrote... The Raffles detective or the Raffles crime novels, he ran during the war in Amya, a top. I can't remember where it was. I'd have to check the, the article. But Horning's running this, he's too old to, to serve. So his, his war service involves him going and running the circulating library. And there, he keeps very good records of what gets taken out, what, what men are, are reading. In this library, and I have a feeling that Buchan, along with Kipling and Tennyson, and sort of what and Scott, sort of what you'd expect, is there. I'd have to go back and double check the article that that Ed wrote on that. My belief is that yes, it is it is quite popular, even if men don't necessarily carry this stuff with them. They read it and then they give it to somebody else, and then they, which which always it's it's really difficult to get a, a grip on how popular something is in that, those sort of circumstances. Which makes, makes you wonder if it, what, what they're getting out of it. Is it, is it reassuring them why the war started? Because it, it is set, you know, weeks before. Is it three weeks before the war or something like that? Uh, it is just weeks before the war. Uh, the, the, fi- the, the final paragraph is three weeks later, as all the world knows, we went to war. I joined the new army the first week and owing to my Matabili experience, got a captain's commission straight off. But I had done my best service, I think, before I put on khaki. Until you read, read the next three books and discover that actually he single-handedly yeah. <laughs> wins the war. Because, uh, well, we should, we've, we, we should cover the next three books it, where, we, where we look at them because there's that weird thing where it suddenly flips to be, be a very military novel. There's, uh, there's uh, the third book. That was Mr. Stanfast, isn't it? Uh, from from Brain rather than... Uh, an adventure book. There's a, there's an extra weird echo in this book. So when after you know he's been running around Scotland and he's you know trashed most of the motor vehicles in the, in the northern area, um, and you know he's been roughed up a little bit and all that stuff, and he gets down to London and he's has you know he manages because 
you know, everyone's a cracking good fellow. Um, he gets into, bursts into the, was it the cabinet and the foreign office? And they're talking about the, yes. the plans and the French are there. Well, he, it's in a private, it's in a, it's in a private house, which is. Is it yeah. Wal- Walter Boulevard's house? Walter's house at Queen Anne's Gate, yeah. Which had, has been infiltrated by a nefarious German spy who's just escaped by, was he pretending to be Winston Churchill? Something like that. No, the first sea law. That's it. Um, there's a bit in there. Because you've got the French military representatives as well. And the British are all kind of like, oh, good, good, you know, good grief. I don't know what to do. And the French are like, don't worry. I have some experience of spies in my country. Um, and this is, this is how they, how they operate. And I, I found that super interesting because in the lead up to, let me actually get the, the date. Ah, it's actually, it's published in September 1914. There's a WK Hazelden cartoon, um, called Spy Mania, which appears in the Daily Mirror. Which is basically that whole conversation in uh, cartoon form, um, but it's it's done in a really weird way. So it tells the story of this this English guy who goes on holiday on the continent and he's taking photographs and then gets arrested by the military police and you know dragged up in front of the minister of war and given a a stern talking to and a fine and then kicked out of the country. And the 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 text of the cartoon is you know this is what happens to any good Englishmen in Germany because, you know, they understand espionage in these countries because they're, you know, the type of underhanded low fellows to use it. Um, we don't understand espionage because we're far too honourable to have need of it. So that you get the whole, you know, this is what it's like in Germany. But all of the, the European, the German characters are French. They're all big round Frenchmen with kepi hats on and big twirly moustaches and the like. And this idea that firstly, you can just roll all of Europe together. They're, you know, they're very much an identikit people. But, you know, they understand spies over there because they're just so devious and we don't understand spies. And that's what that French guy at the war museum, at the the military meeting is saying to them. As I say, you can trace a line back from James Bond to these to these novels and various academics have at various conferences that I've been to. But at this point, there there is a real reluctance to admit to spying. It, it, it's sort of, you know, airmen don't have parachutes, which is relevant for Mr. Sternfeld, um, for exactly the same reason the British don't spy. There is a short, a sapper short story, which is published in the Daily Mail originally and then collected after the war, um, which is about a spy where, which is called The Spy, which is about a German spy in British front lines, where Sapper is quite clearly trying to, you know, wants to make him the honourable enemy in some ways, but he's, you know, has, has to have all these qualifications that the British don't spy. This is not a British thing to do. And yet what Penny and Sandy Abuthnot in particular, and, and Blenkiron, actually, um, the American, who we haven't mentioned yet, um, although he, he'd only turns up in, in Green Mantle in the first instance, but they are spies fundamentally. And, and Blenkiron, admits to being one, you know, uh, he talks about American neutrality. What's his phrase for it? Benevolent neutrals. But at one point when they're when in Green Mantle, when they end up in, when they're in Constantinople and Blancaren's there as an American industrialist and he, Cornelius Brand, the, 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 the character that, that Hanny was playing, has to disappear because there are too many people on his trail um, and becomes Richard Hanau. Um, who who was also a benevolent neutral who got to Constantinople and became twice as benevolent and lost his neutrality. Um, there's this, it's not just those Europeans who do spying, it's also the Americans. It's everybody but the good, honest British, and yet they are. And it's a, it's a contradiction that I'm, among the many contradictions in these novels, that, that I don't think Buckingham ever, ever manages to square properly and probably doesn't really get squared properly until you get John le Carre trying to actually tackle the 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 morality of spying head on i mean that that spy fever sort of novel we start with the invasion novels don't we which are also by blackwell magazine with the uh, battle of dorking which then we get which morphs into uh riddle of the sands in 1935 is that pre-war sp- spy fever novel of you know, Britain's full of spies, uh, probably German. Does Thirty Nine Steps act as a full stop for that style of spy novel, and do they shift more into an adventure style novel, which we which which is 
moving closer towards the James Bond model of the, the, the spy narrative. I think they do. Because once war has broken out, you can't really have... Spies and invasion of being caught unawares and the like. Invasion fears, yeah. I think the point you make about, about planes is an interesting one, Angus, because, and this is Sue Grazel's work on the gas, has been doing some of this on the gas mask, that in the 1930s, it, it, it's not invasion so much as air attack and bombing from the air. I mean, there is, there is an element of invasion, you know, the, the idea that German paratroopers will drop as nuns in various bits of the quiet countryside. Where, where does that image turn up? That's the, uh, what's the film? There's a, a wartime film, isn't it, where they... Uh... But, but that, that, I mean, that becomes a cliche, right? 1942, Went the, went the Day well, well, written by Graham Greene, which is about a, uh, an invasion film, isn't it? It's a British propaganda sort of, uh, invasion uh, film. See, I, 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 I think it, it turns up again at the start of the Second World War. I mean, the, 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 those invasion narratives grew out of the of of the dreadnought race, right? It comes back to technology, though, doesn't it? It's, it's the stealing of technology, which goes back to the again. The, there are films about military technology being being sort of lost. It's about plane specifications, isn't it, for uh, Hitchcock rockets? But it, it's it's also about national borders, right? It, that. So, so it, you know, if if the Germans have too many of their own ironclads, then Britain's naval dominance is threatened, and Britain's sense of identity as a the the, the metropole's sense of identity, and this has to be distinguished from the imperial identity, which I think is complicated. You know, suddenly becomes threatened if 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 the three if the sea is a threat, and that the channel is only a. A defence as long as we are not complacent behind it. Yeah, and and then in Mister Stanfast, um, the spy gets dropped off in a submarine in Scotland. And he, I think that it's a submarine plot in the BBC uh, version. He, he's leaving in a submarine in nineteen fourteen, which I'd confused uh, in my head because when I was reading about in Thirty Nine Steps, I go, oh, you know, we need to find, you know, there's there's got to be something about these this, these beaches that makes it. I was like, oh. Hang on a minute. I know this. It's because it's a submarine, and it turns out it's not a submarine. It's just a boat. Oh, up, and it's, it's slightly disappointing. It's just thirty-nine steps down to somewhere on the south coast. Seems almost undramatic compared to the BBC's. It's a lock and a submarine, and it's much more espionage than just a yacht off the south coast somewhere, which seems sort of obvious in in a public view. But but the riddle of the sounds. Erskine Childers was a very good writer. It involves this incredibly complex plot to do with tides. It's about boats again. It's not U-boats it, because they're not part of the public imagination at that point, which they are now, you know, post Second World War. Of course, it's going to be a U-boat rather than a yacht, but um, it's all about small boats, leisure boats, um, and this incredibly complex plot with tides that I always get lost in every time I read the novel. <laughs> um, it's a bit like reading um, Five Red Herrings by Dorothy L. Sayers, which all works on train timetables, and I'm fine until I get to the train timetables, and then I completely lose what's going on. <laughs> um, I'm even worse with tides. There's something else that struck me about that idea of spy fever. By the time you get to the film, the Hitchcock film, so the, 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 it's a femme fatale sort of spy, is murdered in his rooms, and rather than Hannah automatically thinking, I better call the police, he thinks, I, I better go on the run. And so he goes downstairs, he says to the milkman, there's a spy in my room who's just been murdered and I'm about to leave because I'm going to be framed. And the milkman says, oh, don't talk nonsense, sir. And I wondered if that was almost a reflection of how spy fever had moved on by 35 and becomes dis disbelieving. And he has to say, oh, no, actually, I'm having an affair and she's in my room. And they go, oh, okay, sir, that's fine. You have my milk jacket and off, off you go. Well done, well, well done you. In, in, the, in the novel, it's a bet. My friend, uh, it's 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 PG Woodhouse, right? It's it's a drones club bet. <laughs> There's a lot of PG Woodhouse sort of in a lot of this. Uh, this sort of comes through, especially the dialogue, and it, clearly he's uh, PG Woodhouse is aping this style because it, because it cuts across just about every type of literature. I'm not sure Woodhouse is necessarily aping this. So George Simmers has made the point that after the war, you get a particular brand of facetious mimetic that that appears um and he uses uh dornford yates as as an example of this i don't think it originates with buck and essentially i think it's 
it's much more widespread in British literary culture. And it, what it does pick up on is, I think, a sense of the way soldiers spoke to each other. Archie Roylance in Mr. Stanfuss, uh, Hannah comments about the way in which the RAF or the RFC, as it was, the language that they develop uh, and how, how it changes very rapidly. And I, I think there, there's an element of which military language enters literary language um, after the war that, that's more widespread. And that's what, what Woodhouse is picking up on. It's interesting you say, but I'd, I'd forgotten about the line about uh, how the, uh, the flying cock was reinventing language. That goes back to modernity again and, and the war where things are new and then it's all changing, constant change as, as things are being developed and shifted. A new technology needs new language. Planes come into this quite a lot. In the films, it always seems to be, it's, it's uh, uh, certainly the 78 film, it's a monoplane. Is it a monoplane in the book? Yeah. So that's interesting as well. It's not a biplane, which is, which again, it, it, it seems, you know, to me, monoplanes of the 30s, they really are the technology of the future. And there's a whole thing in, in Mr. Stanfast about how it's um, Lynch. He's not Richthofen because Richthofen does get a name check as, as not being as impressive as Lynch is. Um, but the, the Richthofen figure uh, who has this new short winged plane and then Archie Roylance has his Gladys, which is is difficult and its engine keeps conking out, but is the one that, that Peter Pienaar ends up loving and flying um, when he kills Lynch and kills himself in the, in the process. So there is something about plane technology. Now, Book, Booken, this has just popped into my head, is also at the same time as writing this, he's starting to write his histories of the First World War, isn't he? Do we see any of that in the 39 States? slightly curious that you're writing uh, fiction books about the First World War whilst at the same time writing you know, millions of words for one of, the, one of the first histories of the war as it's ongoing. A serialised history of something that's happening now, as it were. I think, I think it comes up more in Green Mantle and Mr. Stanfast, where you get a lot more of sort of the, God, Mr. Stanfast has a lot of descriptions of battles. Right at the end, the French turn up again, Chris. At the end, I, I know you haven't written, they, they, and 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 they are embraced. They they are the relief, and and Hanny is delighted to see them. So that's possibly one we should revisit when we look at Mister Stanfast, uh, his connection with writing the history of the war, and potentially if there's lots of lots of the French in there, we could do a, a fun comparison between that and Sapper's portrayal of the French at various points in Bulldog Drummond, which is always quite fun when they appear. Oh, well, I'm gonna, does that mean I have to go back and reread Bulldog Drummond again? I can't remember the French in Bulldog Drummond. What more do we have to say about Hanny? And what is funny is he never actually solves anything, does he? Have you noticed that? He's no Sherlock Holmes. He's somebody who reacts to things without necessarily directly instigating a solution. He might have a gut instinct, which t thankfully turns out to be right. Otherwise, the plot would collapse, which moves him from... He, he, does, he, he does solve part of the riddle in Green Mantle, one of them while in a malarial fever, and one because he he overhears various things that are whispered. Um, so he get he gets Hilda von Einem's name because he realizes that that what he was reading as I should actually be read as one, which in German German is Einem. He does he does a little bit. There's a very set pattern to these novels, not just in terms of shifting location, but there, it starts with some sort of cryptic puzzle. You know, Scudder's Diary, Harry Bullivant's Three Puzzles in Green Mantle. What is it, Mr. Stanfast? The, he, the thing he over, overhears when the spy comes ashore in, uh, in Scotland uh, off of the U-boat. He overhe Pil Pilgrim's Progress. That, that's what they use to communicate with each other, Pilgrim's Progress. But um, but he overhears a conversation with the words Bomertz and Chelius, and that leads him ultimately to Switzerland by via an ad in a newspaper. No, it's not Sherlock Holmes, but it's it's not a, it's a thriller. It's not a detective novel. And I think d d does James Bond ever work out clues? <laughs> he also differentiates it from that kind of spy fever thing, which is normally that two thirteen year old boys deduce everything that's going on, and then, which is how that you know that the spies in in Hanny are, are you know are really serious because they're not being rumbled by two schoolboys. Um, is is this the anti uh, Baden Powell? And actually, um, there's there's an irritating boy scout who gets in the way. 
talking of modernity, the, um, at one point, uh, Hanny escapes from his enemies by getting muddled up in a, in a film crew who are filming an attack. This is Mr. Standfast again. The, the propaganda office, one of the, one of the, they're doing, they're filming men going over the top in a battle and Hanny uh, gets up and, and starts directing the battle as a, uh, at this point he's a general so he, he makes a complete mess of it but, there, but, there's, but there's a persistent boy scout who, who gets in his way at this point and he has to escape from as well <laughs> i mean you know this these are where the cliches come from right i i think i think it's worth remembering that this is this is these are the origin stories and why first the the hitchcock and then the play are so effective is because there are so many of the cliches in the origin story that then have gotten picked up and elaborated. I have a quote that Booker gives to the uh, Boy Scout. He gives a speech to the Boy Scouts in Canada, where he said that he, he says the Scout movement stands firm upon certain great moral principles, for they are the basis of civilization. It teaches the personal duties of courage, self-discipline, patience, and the social duties of sacrifice and sympathy, which very much sort of fits with the Hannah character, really, doesn't it? That idea of the uh, the Boy Scout, how, how Booker viewed it. There's, there's so much more grist to the mill, especially when we get to conscientious objectors, uh, which I think we'll have to say for another day. I, mean, we, it's just I know, we've we hit have. an hour and we haven't even started on conflict. Because I know you wanted to talk about Lancelot Wake. We'll have to, I mean, I think, I think what we're going to have to do is, is make Chris go away and read Mr. Stanfast. Um, and we'll have to have another episode just on Mr. Stanfast and conscientious objectors and the French. And... Because it is fascinating. It is fascinating the view on conscientious objectors, how how he he doesn't really pillory them, which is interesting. And, and pacifists in general, actually, um, and 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 they're not the same thing. Should we point out? <laughs> uh, and then we, then, we, then we could discuss how he also wins the war. Uh, uh, yes, he single handedly yes. stops stop. Well, he single handedly stops the German Spring Offensive. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> his raggedy yeah. band of men and. And, uh, but 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 actually, but actually, there's one of the better descriptions of refugees as well in that book. So okay, we're going. I I think I think we're just going to have to say we we've done the 39 steps with me referencing a lot of other stuff as well on the way, but we're going to have to do Mr. Stamfast itself. Yeah, we get the whole bromance with Peter Pienaar and all kinds of things like this. Plenty more to bring. I mean, do we do we skip to do we need to do Green Mantle first, or can we look at his views on Islamicism? I mean, I think we might have to reference we just Green Mantle. To, uh, Mr. Steadfast. Yeah, yeah. The, it's Femme Fatale's yes. is great mental as well, Green Mantle as well, isn't it? Mis- we get the introduction of the female character. The love interest, Mary, arrives, which I did wonder. I, you, I had been hanging on to see if he marries her, but clearly you've just, you told us earlier that he retires, re- retires to the Cotswold. I did wonder if it, it, it would all fall flat, because I think in a modern book, he wouldn't get the girl and she'd be always dangling on the thread in front of him. No, no, he, he, he gets the girl and they have a son who's called Peter John. Because um, Mary's such a good egg. <laughs> I think if we discuss Mr. Stanfast, we're going to have to discuss Green Mantle, if only because Blaine Kyron gets introduced in Green Mantle. And you can't discuss Mr. Stanfast without, without Blaine Kyron, I'm afraid. <laughs> Before we get to those, there's, there's, there's something for people to start buffing <laughs> up on now uh, in our ad hoc reading club. Um, where are we next time? Were you looking at postcards? Did we pin down postcards? Um, I haven't actually sent that email yet, but hopefully. And, and actually, we, we were wondering maybe maybe that could be put off um, because if we do talk about postcards, we will be having uh, Professor Mark Connolly back on um, and it might be nice to have him on the anniversary of Christmas again. So we might do postcards for Christmas. Our, our annual Christmas with Mark Connolly. Yeah. <laughs> we'll gather around the fire and the, and the wireless and... Tell us a story, Professor. <laughs> um, but 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 I need to get my act together on that one. Um, I will I'll get that sorted out. Wonderful. So I think that's us for now. Thank you. Um, and and I should say thank you thank you to Angus and Chris for indulging me. This was Hanny was my suggestion <laughs> after I banged on about it in <laughs> the King's Man endlessly. <laughs> my whole family has had a, a month of Hanny now uh, of watching films and things. And we haven't been trialing or trailing this one even remotely as long as we trailed Sco- um, Snoopy. So, no, <laughs> but you have indulged my, my love of these novels, um, as, as guilty a pleasure yeah, as well, it is. 39 Steps is, is a very weird thing, but a lot of good fun. Yeah, it's good fun. It's good fun. Well, until next time, thank you very much. Bye. Thank Bye, you. everyone. Bye. Oh.